Hello, Liberty lovers, and welcome to the Liberty Mike podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and I am here with Liberty Larry. How's it going? Doing all right. How are you? Pretty good. 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 Enjoying this cooler weather. Well, we, ha- we not anymore. <laughs> it was it wasn't too bad yesterday. I got out and did some work in the yard. Oh yeah, well, I got up to the low nineties yesterday. We yeah. had we had a nice weekend. Yeah. Well. It, it still seems better than it was. Well, yeah. It's getting cool enough at night that I can turn the temperature down another couple of degrees without the AC running the entire night. That's a win. Yeah, so I have. <laughs> yeah, I bet. I would say I'm sleeping more comfortably, but... <laughs> but that's never the case, right? Not really, no. <laughs> I'm still not sleeping. Yeah. But I'm more comfortable when I wake up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, well, that's good. And... uh And the other day, I completed 30 days straight of exercise every day. Hey, that's cool. Yeah. I mean, I I mostly do that anyway, or pretty close to it, but I had like a a challenge, like not going to be lazy any day. Every day I'm going to do it. Yep. That's good. Do something every day. Every seventh day, it was like just like stretching, but still. Yeah. It it counts. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Um, You're supposed to have a rest day. Every so often, anyway. Yeah. Especially when you're an old man like me. Yeah. I take a lot of rest days. <laughs> Body can't <laughs> handle that anymore. Mm. <laughs> um, do, you, do you hang up your pager? Uh, you know, I, I, I haven't used the pager in a long time. No. <laughs> since, since back in my drug dealing days did I carry a pager. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, that's what my dad used to always say. It's like, there's no reason for anybody to have a pager unless they're a drug dealer. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he's not so, far off. <laughs> well, back then, he wasn't far off at all, I don't think. No, nope. doctors. Yeah, doctors, paramedics. Um, I, I had my dad uncle, was actually law enforcement. He carried a pager. Uh, I was going to say, I had an uncle that um, he was he did, he did was with the fire department. Mm-hmm. And he had, and it, but like his was like a big red when I remember that thing. When it went off, it like went off off like it was like a fire alarm going off (laughs) can't miss this yeah exactly um Um, when i worked on the ambulance we didn't well we had pagers i didn't have a pager that i carried around i had a pager when we were on the ambulance yeah yeah um but we also had cell phones uh, and two-way radios yeah yeah which are also apparently apparently a problem (laughs) right now yeah um so the the pager didn't much get used yeah. But it was there. Yeah. Just in case. <laughs> yeah. Just in case they needed to page you. Like it's just, yeah. just or get whole, rid of me, one of the <laughs> Right. Yeah. Well, there's that, right? No. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that's a that's a crazy story. Yeah. So um, what exactly what exactly do we know? Because I know there's still a lot of information that's not available yet, but Well, um, so we know that the Okay. We know that Hezbollah was switching to pagers from cell phones to to try and eliminate the problem of their messages being intercepted by uh, Israel. Okay. Um, and they ordered something like three thousand pagers. So, and I'm guessing here that the idea was was that they would be paged and then call and talk to them on a separate line or something like that instead of sending messages. Or were they actually oh, sending communications through the pages? I think they were actually sending communications through the pages, but I am not certain of that. Okay. But you can like send coded communications on. Yeah, you can. I know you can. I'm just trying to get an idea of what their thinking was. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. Maybe they're doing it like on the wire. You get the page, you go down <laughs> the cell phone. Well, we just watched that show, and that's actually exactly <laughs> where my mind was at. It's yeah. like, are they sending codes through these pager numbers? Mm-hmm. Or like, I don't know. Like, I, I don't know if they have public phones in Lebanon. Yeah, I doubt they do. When was the last time you saw a public phone? Anywhere. <laughs> Anywhere, yeah. I don't know. I can't remember. I mean, I've seen some shells for them in some rough neighborhoods, but they didn't <laughs> have one in there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I, I'm not sure exactly what the plan was, but I guess the the um, pager communications would have were harder to intercept or at least harder to interpret. Yeah. Than listening to voice-to-voice. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, but they ordered them. The producer was a company out of Taiwan. Um, that company says that they didn't produce this set of pages, that they were um, produced by a company in uh, Hungary. Yeah. Like a, um, a subsidiary or like another company that with production facilities, but that company doesn't have production facilities. Really? Yeah. They're, they're not a manufacturing location or they are, but not for pagers, I guess. Okay. Um, and th- I, I think that it's the, the CEO of that company has some connections to British intelligence. Okay. <coughs> So there might be a connection there. Yeah. Um, the other bit of information that I have that like, I don't know how much of this is like really confirmed at this point, but, yeah. um, is that the, the shipment was held up in customs and some other, um, Middle Eastern country, um, for a while. And that that is probably where they were Dirt. disassembled, <laughs> Booby trapped and reassembled. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to use the term dosed. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't know why. It's Just too. to stay in the drug thing. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, and, uh, and then, yeah. Um, but the, the thing is, well, first off, it wasn't just, uh, Hezbollah that got these pagers. Yeah. So, um, emergency medical and, uh, some other, Industries like that in Lebanon also use pagers. Yeah. So while, like, the idea that this was really targeted isn't totally correct. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Of course, Israel has also... Now, Israel hasn't taken official credit for it, but they've made some statements that make it pretty clear that that they're responsible. One of the clips I heard, they were, like, congratulating whoever had done it or something like that. Uh, oh, um, I heard a clip where uh, they were talking about the great steps that the IDF had made oh, in, really? in their fight against Hezbollah. Oh, okay. <laughs> <and so> <laughs> well. um, but they didn't they didn't explicitly talk about this incident. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it was like immediately afterwards. Yeah. But that's uh, that's how Israel does this kind of thing historically. Like they give a wink and a nod, but they don't. They don't actually, actually just embrace. say, yeah, we did this. Yeah. Um, but they make it clear that they did because the important thing is to avoid any kind of international accountability while still letting your opponent know that you got them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So. Um, and then uh, the... So, yeah, all, all these pagers exploded and then two-way radios also. Um. There's only been maybe a couple of dozen deaths, I think, at this point that have been reported. Um, The last firm number that I heard was 14, but that included like an eight year old, (sighs) uh, like an eight year old girl, I think. Um, Now, Israel has certainly proven throughout most of their history and in Gaza over the last year um, that they really don't have a problem with uh, collateral damage with civilian casualties. So. All these pages were set off. Um, they were supposed to receive a signal and then blow up. It, like, yeah. as I understand it, the mechanism is that they placed the explosive next to the battery and that the signal would cause an overheat of the battery that would trigger the explosive, which is pretty clever, actually, Yeah. Um, in a very sick way. Yeah. And uh, But it's not like they knew who had all of these pagers or where they were or who they were with or anything. Oh, yeah. It was really an indiscriminate attack. And, um, while there's people out there like U S government, even that is kind of saying, well, got to do what you got to do, like deal with <laughs> Hezbollah, et cetera. Um, I mean, you have to recognize that if any foreign power, had done this targeting the United States that we would absolutely consider it an illegal act of terror, no matter what the relation between us and that country were. Oh, absolutely. And, um, I think, well, the UN is, has made some statements critical of Israel in this case, that this was a, you know, um, an indiscriminate, uh, attack 
um, that is unacceptable under international law. Yeah. So, I mean, but nothing will ever come of it, I don't think. I don't think they have a lot of teeth. No. Well, we're the teeth, and yeah, exactly. We don't care. Um, so I, I'm, I'm not sure how this plays out. There were a lot of injuries, though, like yeah. a couple of thousand or more than a couple of thousand yeah. injuries. Yeah. Um, what kind of impact this has on Hezbollah's capabilities? I'm not really sure. I mean, you could be talking about maiming a lot of of Hezbollah people, like blown off hands or yeah. what have you. And I'm sure so, that'll teach them to be part of that organization. Right. <laughs> and, <laughs> and obviously it won't incite anybody else to join up. Exactly. Yeah. Now, the other thing you have to remember is Hezbollah is a political party in Lebanon, like a legitimate political party in Lebanon. It's not yeah. a... It's hard to call it's, them a terrorist organization. Yeah, they're, they're not Hamas. No. Yeah. No. Like this is um, the, they're separate this, organizations, one of which is legitimate. <laughs> yeah. Um, now, you can make a case that Hamas is like a semi-legitimate government organization, too. But yeah. no, but Lebanon is... Hezbollah in Lebanon yeah. is, um, is a real political party. Yeah. And uh, I, I mean, I don't know. It's, it's Israel that's escalating. I mean, it's been tit for tat. And yeah. um, Hezbollah has made it very clear that if that they will stop all um, uh, all their activities against Israel when there is a uh, durable ceasefire in Gaza. Yeah. I mean, they've made it clear yes. that all of this is about the, about the way Israel is um, dealing with the Palestinians. Yeah. And so Israel could bring it into this anytime. Yeah. Anytime they want. But what they keep doing is escalating. Yeah. And the reason that they're escalating, I think, is because they are really, really trying to draw the U.S. into a war with Lebanon. Now, I did see some headlines, but I haven't gotten a look into it. I did see some headlines that there was a huge rocket attack from uh, Lebanon into Israel this afternoon. Oh, really? I haven't heard mm -hmm. about that. Um just headlines though. So I don't yeah, know. Been, yeah. yeah uh, that could even not be true at all. <laughs> no. Or a huge rocket attack could be like a dozen fireworks were fired over <laughs> the border. Or yeah. You never know <coughs> until you really dig into the details. So, um, but whether the real response was now or is yet to come, there will be a real response to this. Oh, without question. Like I said. Um, the, and Israel, this, to me, this is an indication that Israel, I, I would have thought anyway, that this was an indication that Israel was planning a, an invasion of Lebanon. Yeah. But at the same time, like the, it doesn't really make sense because if this was part of an invasion plan, you would think that they You'd would it set quick. it off either immediately before the invasion or as the invasion was happening. Yeah. And so maybe it was just like a, a kind of a coercive tactic. No, I mean, maybe it was just the, let's see if this will work. Yeah. If this is enough to make them back off. Yeah. Or maybe if, like, okay, it worked. So let's scale it up. Oh, well that could be too. That's terrifying. I mean that, that's to me, that's kind of what this has vibes of, of like, mm -hmm. this was a soft run to see if it, it was feasible and could be done. Yeah. And then it's like, okay, well this worked. Like let's, let's scale this up. Um, Max Blumenthal was saying that, um, that it may be that somebody in Hezbollah, he had at least some reason to believe that, that some member or members of Hezbollah had found out about the booby traps. Yeah. Um, and so Israel was put in a position where they needed to just go ahead and do it. Oh, uh, really? Like ahead of their timetable. Yeah. I, I don't know. That doesn't really makes sense to me. Yeah. Because either you're ready to do this or you're not. And also if it some members like of Hezbollah so knew to... about it, it would have been pretty quickly passed around to like <coughs> dump all these things. Yeah. So I don't know. How would they know? Or, and if they did know, how would they know fast enough to prevent essentially a disarmament 
by everybody putting their pagers down. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, so I don't know about that. I don't. I don't really believe that. But that reporting is out there. Yeah. And Max Blumenthal is solid. Yeah, I mean, he's done. He usually digs in pretty good. So. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's still early on, so yeah. I mean, we don't know. Yeah, yeah we're we're gonna learn a lot more about this as time goes on. Probably, probably. I would think so, but maybe <laughs> not. I mean, mm-hmm. I don't know. It depends on how well they can control. I I think the idea though is to try and trigger enough of a response to, um, give Israel the opportunity to plead to the United States that they have to get involved. Yeah. Or to try and induce Iran to get involved and use that to get the U.S. involved. As a way to draw us in. Mm-hmm. I'm hoping that behind the scenes somewhere, there's somebody in our State Department that's talking to uh, the Israeli government and saying, yeah, whatever happens from here, we're not doing anything. <laughs> so you go well, ahead and make your plans without planning on us getting involved. You know that conversation isn't being had. I don't know that. Well, uh, I, I would be shocked. I mean, it just the way with the lobbying, the way that it is. Yeah. It's, it's just hard to believe that there's like straight people in those mm-hmm. organizations that are, that there's, are not bought and paid for. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of Israeli money in our politics. Um, yeah. That's for sure, and and it's not the same as Ukraine, where we are far more likely to do that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. To say, yeah, well, I mean, at this point, you do what you want, but we're not helping anymore. Yeah, I mean, like, we're not getting drawn when farther it, in. When it comes to these two wars, like Ukraine's the side chick. <laughs> that's like, yeah, that's like uh, it's fun for right now, but. But Israel is the real deal. That's the that's the wife you're not leaving. <laughs> like that's the we we got we got way too much history. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. So um, the Ukraine war is not going well for Ukraine. Still, yeah. they're still begging for longer range weapons. There yeah. was uh, some. I don't know how significant they are, but attacks on ammo depots in inside of Russia. Yeah. How much that really sets Russia back, I don't know. Uh, it pisses them off, I'm sure, though. Yeah. Uh, the truth is that this this war is a foregone that war is a foregone conclusion. Yeah. And and actually, the Israel, if they were to decide to invade Lebanon that would be a huge mistake too. Yeah. And I think that they know that. Even with us backing them? Because I'm sure that's the play. I mean, I'm sure they realize that them going in on their own is a mistake. Yeah. But them coercing us to at least give them as much um, support as we're giving Ukraine now, mm-hmm. um, that that's enough to give them the edge. Maybe, but I think that that's why... You try and um, incite Lebanon into a big response, and maybe them invading. Well, I don't yeah. think the U.S. follows Israel in a in a unilateral invasion of Lebanon. I think yeah. I think if Israel could make the case that they are um, repulsing an attack and then moving into Lebanon, that maybe. We, we get I, on board. I think that well, they would so, have to make the case that they were having to repulse an attack from Lebanon in order to get us involved. Yeah. I think if when Israel involved, invades though, Lebanon outright, I don't think that the U.S. participates. Yeah. When you say don't, you mean like boots on the ground? Yes. Okay. But I mean, yeah, I'm like sure, being an unquestionable part of this war. Yeah. But I'm sure we're sending, if they do go in, we're mm-hmm. sending stuff over there and giving them some, like that, maybe um, material yeah. support. Well, we're already giving them a ton of. Well, exactly. Munitions. That's my point, though, is like, how much more do we up that if they go in? No, no, no. There's, okay, I don't, I think that there's a very, very uh, minute chance that we get real boots on the ground in Ukraine. I mean, I think we have some boots on the ground, but it's, yeah. you know, small squad forces. Like, 
Yeah, basically yeah. enough to S- run some, some of special the ops and some intelligence yeah. stuff, and yeah, yeah, and tech guys. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I think uh, so. The chances of having <coughs> combat forces in on any kind of scale in Ukraine, yeah. U.S. combat forces in any kind of scale in Ukraine is is really small. Very yeah. minute chance. No, I, I agree with that. Um, I don't think that that I don't think the same way about Israel. You I think, think that there's a much bigger quick. chance of us having, yeah, yeah um, well, real combat forces there's at less, scale in yeah. Israel. There's just less repercussions for us because we're already so involved militarily in the Middle East anyway. Yeah. Um, and who's the big dog that we're worried about coming after us if we do get in over I, there? Iran and Russia. Yeah, I mean, agreed, but. Our our State Department isn't viewing it that way. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> I mean, their their position is going to be we don't care about them, <laughs> or they won't yeah. get involved. Or they won't. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Well, it seems that the U.S. is taking seriously finally the the threats from Russia, uh, because the U.K. was planning to send long range missiles into Ukraine. Yeah, and there was a meeting with. Ostensibly Biden, but who knows? <laughs> but yeah, um, whoever's running the shadow government at this point. Yeah, at, at which point I I don't know if it's been announced or they just decided not to talk about it anymore. But there aren't long range missiles going from the UK into Ukraine now. Really? Uh, but when the UK announced that they were going to do that, um, Putin uh, gave a, a kind of an impromptu in- interview outside of the Kremlin saying. Um, well, at that point, I don't think that you can deny anymore that the that NATO, um, the U.S., these European countries are participants, and that we would have to respond appropriately to that. Yeah. And uh, even Lavrov, um, who is generally the voice of reason, he's not like Medvedev up there just firebrand no. talking about how Russia is going to destroy it. Everything. Lavrov's a, a real seasoned diplomat um, and is always very careful about the way he, he speaks of the possibilities. But he was saying what a, he, he gave a talk or an interview. I guess it was just a, a speech, though, um, where he was saying it would be a real mistake for the, uh, the West to step up its involvement in Ukraine, knowing that. Russia is a serious nuclear power and that they are and that they have protocols about when they can use nuclear weapons and that they're revising them yeah, uh. um, to better protect themselves. <laughs> and I, I think maybe finally the hint got through or maybe finally somebody got on the phone from the Kremlin to the White House and said, yeah. look, this isn't a joke. Yeah. <laughs> like well, we've come this far, how much further are we going to drag this? Yeah. Like we have, we have been surprisingly tolerant of your involvement yeah. so far, but there is a limit. Yeah. And we do have responses that we can use. Oh, absolutely. And let's be serious. If we drop a, a tactical nuke in Ukraine, yeah. What are you really going to do? Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, you yeah. can sit over there and talk tough. Yeah. But are you really going to launch a nuclear war? Yeah, because that's that's the option. Yeah. Exactly. Because if you escalate into nukes, yeah, exactly. we have to escalate too. Yeah, it only goes one way. Yeah. yeah. So, and the question has has to be posed at some point: Do you is Ukraine really worth your entire country to you? Yeah. Yeah. And I sure hope that the answer is no. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I mean, we discussed this at the beginning of the war. Mm-hmm. Um, Putin doesn't really care what happens to Ukraine. Like, it can be a graveyard for all he cares. Yeah. He, wants, he just wants a buffer. He wants a buffer. That's all he's after. Mm-hmm. And if he needs to drop a, drop a few nukes to create that buffer, in yeah. the end of the day, that's what he'll do. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, don't he think, wants I don't to avoid think, that. I don't it's, think that's what he wants to no. do because obviously, if it's what he wanted to do, he would have already done it. Yeah. Um, he's just trying to make a point here, mm-hmm. and and I, I, we've both said on this podcast, I don't agree with the way he's doing it. Yeah. But that is what he's trying to do. That is his goal here. Yeah. He just at some point, I think, 
Russia just has to remind the U.S. or the U.S. just has to remember that the U.S. does not actually have escalatory dominance. Yeah. Like, well, we can't escalate higher than Russia. They can't yeah. either. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, but that's kind of the point. It's not like fighting in Iraq or Afghanistan or someplace where we always have escalatory dominance. Yeah. We don't have escalatory dominance over Russia. Yeah. Yeah. It's just mutual destruction. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's... that's what, remember what this was all about. Yeah, exactly. So, um, I mean, I hope that they're starting to rein in. The, the truth is that the this gamble into Kursk to whatever Zelensky wanted to do, trade territory or just prove that he was still in it to yeah. maintain support from the West or whatever it is, has backfired horribly. Um, Russia continues to move more quickly, taking more territory in Ukraine. Um, nothing's happening in Kursk. Like, that incursion is going to do nothing. Yeah. Except cost a lot of lives and equipment for the Ukrainians. Yeah. Ukraine has already lost so much. They've already lost this war. I yeah. mean, like, even if they won, if they had some kind of military victory on the field, they have lost. Yeah. There's been a tremendous amount of destruction and loss of life in Ukraine. It'll never recover. Yeah. Well, I say never. It'll take generations it's to recover. It'll take a while, yeah. Um, and so, uh, you know, get on your apps and start looking at those Ukraine wives now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, cause there's going to be a lot more women than men over there for a long time a to long come. Time, yeah. <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah, it's, it's a huge, it's, it's been a huge mistake. I, I'm not sure entirely. I mean, I know that the U S thought that they were going to severely weaken Russia, um, draw them into a war that they couldn't win, but it's not a war that they can't win. Yeah. And, um, it hasn't severely weakened Russia. Uh, and in fact, you, they the are argument. absolutely the dominant military force in Europe now. Yeah. Well, on top of that, I would say that it's severely weakened us. Yeah. As far as financially. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, this is, I mean, the, all the money we've poured into this is not. Well, it's not just that, too. It's also weakened us militarily because yeah. of all the equipment that we've poured into both Ukraine and now Israel. Yeah. If somebody were to attack us, I don't know that we have the stocks to deal with it. Not yeah. for very long. Well, I was going to say not for long. I mean, I mean because they've already talked about um, instead of our normal shipments of these uh, air defense missiles to other countries in the world, we're going to send them all to Ukraine. Like yeah. we don't have enough to send them to Ukraine and send them to everybody that we already had obligations to. Yeah. What does that mean for our own stockpiles, for the stockpiles for the U.S.? I mean, yeah. I don't know. Maybe, maybe yeah. there's somebody back there in logistics that's smart enough to hold on to enough stuff for us, but for how long? Yeah. Like that what, becomes the question is I think that, I mean, I think there are always enough there for an initial like go round, mm -hmm. but like how long can we sustain something like that? Um, given like, given how much we've put out there, you know? Yeah. So this has been a, we, I would say that Russia passed the test and we did not. Yeah. Yeah. This didn't go, I mean, it, it may not have gone the way Putin thought at the beginning. In fact, it certainly didn't go the way Putin <laughs> thought at the beginning. I think yeah. that he really believed that to make the show of force and show that he was serious would have been enough. Yeah. And actually, he wasn't wrong about that. Yeah. They were at the negotiating table. They yeah. had essentially a deal two months into that war. Yeah. And, and we 86'd it. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, that was admitted to by um, Victoria Newland just recently. Yeah. So we, we put an end to the negotiations. We extended the war. Now it's gone on that much longer. Another two and a half years close to now. Yeah. Right? Is my math right? It would have been April 2022 when yeah. it was done. So... If, yeah. if they had if followed they through had. with those negotiations, yeah, um, potentially, I mean, I guess we don't know that they would have come to a final deal, but they said that they had but essentially they were, a deal yeah, they were on the close. table. Yeah. yeah. Um, so another two and a half years. And honestly, if we hadn't have been there, not only, um, telling Zelensky not to take it, but giving material support, yeah. like he absolutely would have capitulated. Yeah. Um, 
And the example I like to bring up of that is because it's recent. I mean, hopefully people remember because it was a huge thing in the news when we were pulling out of uh, Syria about what about the Kurds? What, what about, about the, the Kurds? Kurds? The Kurds are going to be destroyed. <laughs> what about the Kurds? Because we'd been supporting the Kurds the whole time against the central government in Syria, against Bashar al-Assad. Yep. And of course, once we were out of there and it was a done deal, we didn't hear anything more about the Kurds. Yeah. I'm here to tell you that it's not because the Kurds were wiped out by Bashar al-Assad. <laughs> yeah. What happened was, then the Kurds negotiated with Bashar al-Assad. Yeah. When they were no longer getting U.S. support, yeah. they were forced to make a deal. Yeah. And they're still living there. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah. They made a deal. Yeah. Well, and that's, so that's the big thing that they're throwing at Trump right now, is that... Uh, that that Trump just wants to give Russia everything and just mm-hmm. like just like walk away and give him give him whatever he wants. Okay. Um, well, the truth is is for one, that's not how Trump's going to operate. Like no. he's not going to just like <laughs> give them whatever they want. Say but, what you want. The man is not a doormat. No, but he will negotiate mm-hmm. into the war. Like yeah. I do believe that. Like mm-hmm. I think that once that, and he claims he'd do it before as as president elect. Yeah. And actually, I don't think that he's that far off as far as that goes. Too, I'm willing mm-hmm. to bet he probably could negotiate that as president elect. But either way, the fact that like that's what we need here. Um, we don't. And in this whole argument that well, you know, you're just going to give away all the work we've done and, and where we're at with Ukraine. It's like, man, like this is over. Yeah. Like the, anything, any resources we pour into this at this point is just wasted. Yeah. Um, and we've already wasted enough of our resources and their lives. Mm-hmm. Like that's the way it should be looked at. Um, so it's just, but in the media, there's been a lot of talk about, about Trump just wanting to, to just like give Russia whatever they want and just, that's not what's happening here. That's not what will happen. Yeah. Uh, the, the question that should be asked is which is more important? Which government controls these territories? Yeah. Or the lives of the people that'll be lost if we continue to fight? Exactly. Exactly. I mean, I, to me, it's not even a question, yeah. but to apparently representatives of government, which government controls these territories is far more important than the lives that are in them. Well, it's because it's the empire. Yeah. Not like well, it's not we... just that. I mean, it's... It is on our side. That's well. For that's sure, what I'm getting at. Is is our empire as far yeah. as like the to these... the Ukrainian the Ukrainian government feels that way too. Yeah. Um. And the Ukraine does not have an empire. Yeah. But Ukraine has uh, <coughs> the Ukrainian government wants the resources, human and otherwise. Yeah. In those territories, that's why it's, that's why territory is important to government is yeah. because whichever government controls the territories gets to exploit the resources and the people. Yeah, well, that's part of the resources. That's the, that's the resources. I mean, there's yeah. no difference yeah. as far as the government's concerned between yeah. people and product. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I agree with that. It's all resources. It's all resources. Yeah. Um, the the question on uh, for the libertarians is that you know who should be making those decisions, and at least in these four territories that Russia claims, um, the there's been votes, and they voted to become a part of the Russian Republic. That yeah. doesn't mean that everybody's there. Everybody there wants to be Russian. Yeah. Just means a majority. <laughs> but a majority does. Yeah. And a pretty significant majority in, um, I, I think in all of the oblasts, I think it was like yeah. 80% plus everywhere. I think one of them may have been in the high 70%. But still, that's a... Yeah. I mean, we we won't get a, a result like that in our election. No, that's... Well, we might. <laughs> well... <laughs> it wouldn't be a legitimate result. Yeah, there, there you go. <laughs> but we might see one. I mean, Saddam Hussein was getting like 99% of the vote or something in um, yeah, the Iraq. Kim, <laughs> the Kims get, you know, 98% of the vote or something in North Korea, too, yeah. so... Um, but the, you know, we know that those are sham elections. Yeah. There's been no evidence that the, um, that the, uh, the votes in these oblasts were shams. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I mean, I just assume let those people decide who's going to govern them instead of us deciding who's going to govern them. Oh, for sure. And Russia is <laughs> It's not the Soviet Union. They're not building fences around their territory to keep people in. Yeah. Exactly. Like, if you end up in 
a Russian oblast that used to be Ukraine and you don't want to be governed by Russia, I bet they let you leave. Yeah, you can just leave, right? <laughs> oh. So um, on that point of, well, Trump's just going to give away everything, uh, that seems to be one of the main um, issues that motivated the most recent Trump assassination Assassin would be assassin. Would be assassin. Yeah, yeah. there you go. Um, I think so. I'm supposed to say alleged still because he's still alive. But pff, yeah, I mean, uh, hey, hey, I'm not a court of law. Yeah, <laughs> I'm entitled to my opinions. Um, so this guy, uh, I'll say this: he's been. I mean, he, he obviously he's been involved with the war in Ukraine. Yep. Um supposedly as a civilian because he's just so motivated yeah. about Ukraine uh, that he, you know, has tried, has led recruiting efforts, um, appeared in an Azov Battalion promotional video a couple of years ago, apparently. Yeah. Um, Azov Battalion is a bunch of Nazis, don't forget. Okay, yeah. Well, like real honest-to-God Nazis. He was like in a, in a uh, Descendants of the Galician commercial. SS Nazis, like Nazi <laughs> Nazis. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, yeah, I heard that too. He's, he's in a, like, we're two for two here with I, guys yeah. in black rock commercials. Like, tell that's me. some pretty random stuff. I mean, it, it's it's worth asking the question. I don't know. I mean, I don't know either. But you got to at least ask the question. Yeah. Like, I mean, what what is going on here? Um, but the the point that I wanted to make with this guy is that because he's been so involved with what's been going on in Ukraine. Um, with, you know, trying to recruit for the war effort over there, over here, all over the place. And the guy has clearly moved very freely in and out of this country. Well, that's I mean, I just can't imagine that he was this involved in this and didn't have contact within the Pentagon and intelligence services in the U.S. Yeah. I, mean, I just can't imagine. Well, that that's kind of my point is how has this guy moved around as much as he has mm -hmm. and and not been stopped or flagged? I mean, Tulsi Gabbard's having trouble getting on a plane. Yeah, no and and this guy is just flying around wherever he wants to go. Something mm -hmm. ain't right. Yeah. Like, I mean, something's go something's afoot here. Yeah. Uh, and I don't know I don't know what it is. Like I don't I'm not sitting here saying I have all the answers, but mm -hmm. I'm, I am saying, like, they ain't asking these questions in the media. Like, I mean, there's, I mean, I, it's just something, something smells. Yeah, it doesn't seem right. Uh, the, the, you know, the other thing about this guy is that he is clearly bought into all of the mainstream narratives. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, from what I've seen of, oh, yeah. you know, what exactly. he was saying. That, um, so it's, this is again why the the point about free speech is so important of not allowing governments to control the information that's passed down and and you know who you have access to and yeah and so forth um but he's just a uh, i mean he's just like a fairly typical neocon as far as i can tell yeah in, in terms of his political yeah. beliefs he 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 believes in the empire yeah yeah. I mean, this is a guy that believes in the empire, that believes for some reason that this is a battle between good and evil over there. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I mean, I, I can't relate in any way, but that seems to be the real motivation for the attack. And like, no question here that his concern was that Trump would enter office, give Putin everything he wanted in the war in Ukraine, and that would be the end of it. And this is really important to him because that's just. Uh, you know, giving the devil everything he wants or something. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the way I understand it. <coughs> that's the way it looks. Um, now, maybe that's hyperbole too, but yeah. it doesn't seem like it so far. Yeah. Uh, there is some weird stuff in the media about, well, we can't really, I mean, there's no consistent political belief here. Hmm? <laughs> I mean, it seems that his consistent political belief is the political belief of the CIA. So yeah, right. <laughs> so let's make that connection. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, it, it, this whole deal is strange. I can't. What and something else that in in relation to this that just bothers me is so 
apparently they don't give the same, and this doesn't surprise me, that the the candidates don't get the same Secret Service protection as the president does. Mm. Um, like, I guess they keep a hundred yard, a hundred yard like clearance area around the candidate and like a 300 yard area around the president was okay. some, what was my understanding. Hmm. Um, which if, if Trump had been president, they would have had a security area around the whole golf course. Like they would have had the golf course would have been all secured. Um, but since he's not, they go hole by hole and basically go a hell ahead of him the whole way and, and like scout it and check it out, which is how this guy, part of how this guy was caught. Yeah. Um, so, but my what what blows my mind is we've already had one attempt on this man's life. Like, why wouldn't you just up the security to the max? Like, I mean, it, like I get like okay, he's not the president, so he shouldn't get the same. But once there's a legitimate threat, like what we've seen here, once you just do it till the election's over. Like, mm-hmm. why would you not throw all these resources at this? Well, um, all right, I got a question for you. Yeah. So the the first assassination attempt was a clear failure on the part of his protection. Yeah. Do you think that this was a clear failure on the part of his protection? I don't see how you can think it wasn't. I mean, I mean, it, they I mean, stopped it before it happened. They did I mean, stop they, it before it happened, but I, it, it seems that way to me. I mean, I don't really know, but I mean, that's what, that's, do you not, what do you think? I don't know. I think it's hard to say that it's a clear failure. Um, yeah. I, I think that it's, I, I think that what you're pointing at is probably a more of an issue to focus on that the, the protection that is afforded him just isn't the same. Yeah. Um, I mean, if they're looking a hole ahead and they caught him when they were looking a hole ahead, they're yeah. doing their jobs. They didn't fail at it this time. I would say, okay. I mean, that's fair. Um, still though, the, the fact mm. that we're here yeah, again, just, I don't know. It, oh, it seems like you would just, after the first one, you would, you would just throw everything you could at preventing that from happening mm-hmm. again. Yeah. You would think if nothing else, that there would be a recognition that, um, Trump being assassinated would be like a really terrible thing for this country. Yeah. That would. I mean, I don't well, know what would result from that exactly, but I feel like that would be a real rift in the culture of this country. Oh, I mean, um, I I don't see how you could think it wouldn't be, but I've talked to plenty of people that that don't think it would be as big a deal as as you as I think it would be. Yeah. Like, I mean, I don't I don't know what that would look like and how it would how it would bleed out, mm-hmm. but that it would be it would like I say, it would be crazy, mm-hmm. to say the least. Um, yeah. And but there's a lot of people that don't think that it would be as as bad as what I think it would be. Mm. So I don't know. I don't know how you can look at the culture right now and be like, oh, we could we could get past that. <laughs> like it wouldn't be that big a deal. Like especially if you've interacted with and met a lot of Trump supporters. Yeah. Like I mean, I don't like these people. I mean, and I, like I say, I'm not a Trump supporter myself, but, and I have respect for Trump supporters. I'm not trying to down them or anything, Mm -hmm. but they look at this guy like a deity. (laughs) Yeah, that's, which is scary. It's very scary, but, Mm -hmm. but that they're not just going to take this laying down. Like they're not just going to accept this. There's, there's a lot of people that see an attack on him as an attack on them. Yeah. Oh, that he represents them in some way that I don't understand, but yeah, um, but they really, but they, they believe really believe it. that. Yeah. yeah, no, for uh, sure. I agree. I think that it would be, um, I think that it would be more than than this country could handle. I, I think that it it would be hard to recover from that yeah. um, as a as a unified country. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, because you'd have some, because on the other side of that, there are people that hate him so much that they would be celebrating. Yeah. And I, I don't know. I just, <laughs> yeah. It, it, I'm telling you, it would be a, it would be a nightmare. Mm-hmm. It, it really is a nightmare scenario. Yeah. There was, um, I think it was Dave Smith, uh, who's s- said something like, eh, I guess maybe it was after the first one. Um, who said that the, you know, the people that, that criticize 
Trump so hard and talk about how he's such a threat to democracy and he's, um, you know, so awful and like, oh, but this, uh, you know, assassination attempt is so bad. We hope he's okay. And he's like, you know, I just don't understand. The, how do you reconcile those yeah, two this beliefs? Thing like, uh, this guy is literally Hitler and we hope, uh, Hitler recovers quickly. You yeah, know, like, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, um, yeah, doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. And so, but, but it does just show that it is just rhetoric. That even they don't believe mm-hmm. that he's as bad as they claim that he is. Yeah. Well, I mean, but it shows how dangerous it is. It it shows how dangerous the rhetoric is into inciting somebody to do something like this because, yeah. you know, part of the it, it, I think a significant part of the reason that this guy wanted to get rid of Trump is because he believed the rhetoric about how a guy was going to give up Ukra- all of Ukraine to Russia. Yeah. Um, and. And so at the same time, um, apparently, uh, Daryl Cooper, who does the Martyr Maid podcast, which is a great podcast, by the way, like if you're into history at all, this guy does, um, it's like the, um, a Dan Carlin's hardcore history. So any of you that listen to Dan Carlin's hardcore history and enjoy that, you would absolutely enjoy Daryl Cooper's Martyr Maid podcast. It's the same kind of thing. Deep, deep dive on some particular topic lot of detail, um, very even handed presentation. Yeah. Uh, I, I think his stuff's great. I've listened to a bunch of his podcasts, not even close to all of them because he'll do six part, five hours per part series on some <laughs> tiny little bit of American history or whatever. And yeah. it's hard to find time for that kind of thing. But, um, he, uh, Fear and Loathing in the New Jerusalem was a six-part series, probably 30 hours yeah. on the entire, and I mean like the entire history of uh, Israel, or uh, the, Zionism and Palestine and, yeah. and is the formation of Israel and the relations uh, before and at the time of the formation and since and so forth. And it's fantastic. Like yeah. there's so much information in there. So if you were ever <laughs> curious um, about how we got from where we were to where we are in regard to this part of the world and you have, and you can spare 30 hours, highly recommend, yeah. highly recommend it. It's yeah. really good. Um, and like, oh, he's got, he's got a really interesting uh, series on, um, Dostoevsky and um, uh, thus spoke Zarathustra. Uh, oh gosh, what's the philosopher's name? Um, I've got a couple of his books on my shelf, including that one, yeah. <laughs> actually. Um, Genealogy of Morals, Nietzsche, Friedrich oh. Nietzsche. Okay. Um, talking about the two of them and how their lives aligned and um, and then separated. Uh, Nietzsche was after Dostoevsky and had written almost everything that was of real import in his life, I think, before he discovered Dostoevsky. But, um, and of course, Nietzsche was a philosopher. Dostoevsky was an author, but they were dealing with a lot of the same themes. And it, I, I haven't listened to all of that, but yeah. but it's also fascinating. Yeah. Um, He's supposed to have one on Epstein too, right? Yeah, I, I haven't listened to any I haven't of that. caught it, but I, when he was on the show the other day, he was promoting it, and I was like, okay, yeah. I, Need to check this out. So, speaking of, rather than just promoting his podcast, should yeah. get, get to the point yeah. exactly. Um, but if you're into history, definitely check out Martyr Made podcast. It's really good. Yeah. And if you're into history and you haven't listened to Dan Carlin's Hardcore History, check that one out too because it's yeah. also really good. He's yeah. got the uh, really great um, like six hours on uh, the development of the nuclear bomb. We um, listened to that on a road trip, and, yeah. and I found it fascinating. Yeah, it was, it, it's, it's really it's, good. That was so, like the third time that I'd listened to that when we were oh, really? listening to it on the way yeah. back from Birmingham and or wherever we are. Just what I'll say about it is it's really, it's almost eerie the way he manages to put you in that time period. Like you really feel like you're kind of living through this event in mm-hmm. history. It is, it's really well done, like yeah. I say. Well, and um, so Daryl Cooper has the same kind of gift, except it's not as much... I mean, I think he's probably trying to do the same thing about like making you feel like you're kind of in immersed that in that. Yeah. yeah. Um, but what Daryl Cooper's really good at is, uh, is like empathy, I guess. Yeah. He like, 
he's able to put himself in the place of all the actors involved. Yeah. And that's kind of what got him in trouble here. here. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, apparently he's been working on a world war two series, like trying to do the history from the perspective of the Germans. Yeah. Because we, we get plenty of perspective from the allies. Yeah. Like that is our history of world war two. That's what we're all taught. Yeah. Um, and he's trying to to give it from the perspective of like, okay, this is a people that felt like they were surrounded and trapped and didn't have a choice. Yeah. And he's not justifying it, but he's but the reasons for it are important to address. Examine, yeah. Um in the same way that we have been that we, this podcast, has been talking about the Ukraine war all this time. Yeah. We're not trying to justify Putin's actions, but we want you to understand why. That yeah. it is reasonable from his perspective. Yeah. And so, but this is something that, that Daryl's actually really good at is, <laughs> is, um, is talking about these events from the perspectives from all, all sides. Yeah. And, uh, he, <laughs> I guess on Tucker's show said something along the lines of that, um, Winston Churchill was as responsible for world war two as Hitler was. Yeah. And ignited a firestorm. Yeah. You can't just run around saying that type of thing. Yeah. But it's actually not a, it's not an unheard of perspective. No. Um, the, there were plenty of British historians after world war two that were talking about that as well. Yeah. Um, the problem is in the way he describes it is that world war two has become one of these, uh, um, Oh gosh. He's, he talks about it in, uh, architectural terms like it's a supporting um, structure of history oh, man, I, of like of the narrative though yes. it's something like that it's like you know that that world war ii has become a supporting structure of our narrative about ourselves yeah. and so therefore the prevailing narrative the prevailing story of world war ii can't be questioned at all yeah. um Churchill and uh, FDR and um, Truman and all these guys were heroes and Hitler was a villain and you can't ask any questions about that. Yeah, that, those are the facts. And <laughs> like, take this, <laughs> this is it. Uh, it was a battle of good and evil and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, of course, the truth of history is far more nuanced than that. And if you stop and think about it for a second, you know that because all these people are people. Yeah. And... You know, people may be good or bad or whatever, but people are generally acting in their own self-interest and they're acting in a way that they think is beneficial to them. Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, we try and talk about um, leaders of countries that we don't like, like Kim Jong-un um, or the Ayatollah or Bashar al-Assad or whoever, the person, or Putin yeah. for that matter. Um, as crazy people that aren't acting rationally, but yes, they are, they're acting rationally from their perspective. It's rational what they're doing. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I hope that, that we present some of that on this, on this podcast of like trying and get our listeners to understand, yeah, what they're doing makes sense from the way they must perceive the actions of those opposing them, including the United States. Yeah. Um, and so it's not actually an unreasonable statement that he made, but you're not allowed to question any of this <laughs> yeah. um, because it's important for the U.S.'s self-image that history be like this. And yeah. so the mistake that he made was to question the unquestionable narrative. Yeah. And um, I think that it's... We, we talk about free speech a lot on this podcast. And so he was able to say it and they tried to cancel him and they failed because there's enough other outlets and he got enough support for, from the people that listen to his podcast and people that know him and, and so forth to, to keep him afloat Yeah. through this. But, um, the very fact that any of these things can't be questioned, like whenever you get to the point where you're making those statements of the history is settled, the science is settled, what, whatever it happens to be when you've shut down discussion and um, prohibited any kind of questioning of, of what, of the structure that you want, then you're not doing anybody any favors. It doesn't help us to find truth to not be able to question yeah. 
um, to question these things. And the motivations of somebody like Hitler or Churchill or how these wars could have been prevented, these are important things to explore. Yeah, so we don't do it again. Yes. Like, I mean, that that should be the goal here. Like, we don't want World War III. <laughs> like, like, that's not, not good. Yeah. Um, as much as we're watching the battle lines being drawn as we speak, like, we want to do everything we can to prevent that. Yeah. And it's not... It, I think that most people at this point accept that... Um, if the U.S. hadn't gotten involved in the way it did in World War I and completely turned the tables yeah. um, and given so much power to the Allies and permitted the Allies to, uh, to sign a, a punitive peace treaty with Germany, yeah. that World War II wouldn't have happened. Yeah. That the, the end of World War I directly led to World War II. Yeah. Um, but uh, apparently you can't question whether actions could have been taken differently at the beginning of World War II to prevent the conflict. Well, and it's it's funny because, like, that's accepted history. Like, the mm -hmm. fact that what we did after World War I, not so much our getting involved, but mm -hmm. the way that we um, dispersed discipline to Germany, mm -hmm. like, that's accepted. Like, I mean, like, I learned that in school that you know that what we did to Germany after World War One led to World War Two, mm -hmm. but it's everything kind of after that that can't be that that's where those pillars are at. Yeah, I mean Hitler didn't want a two front war. Yeah. Um, he didn't want a war with uh, with France and England at first. He yeah. wanted to focus on Russia. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that was going to be enough of a problem. Yeah, um, and his hand was kind of forced. Yeah. And you could make the same statement about uh, <laughs> France and England, I think, too. I'm, I, I suspect that in the same way that Hitler felt like he was backed into a corner and that his hand was forced, um, so did they. Yeah. But Churchill himself, I think, later in life, made some statements about that, you know, maybe he could have done things differently and avoided yeah, that this it, conflict. That it could have been avoided. Yeah. Through diplomacy, mm -hmm. <laughs> but we don't do diplomacy. Well, anymore. It, but that's and that's the that's the history we need to be or the history lesson we need to be taking right now mm -hmm. is that like do, you do have to use diplomacy. Yeah, I mean, what if um, you know? There's the big question of uh, appeasing Hitler. Like, oh, well, you just have to uh, appease yeah. Hitler. We don't want to appease Hitler. He's evil, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. No. Well, but which would you have rather had? Appeasing Hitler or losing, what was it like? Something like sixty million people? No, that yeah. it was, that's too big a number. Forty million? I don't know the numbers. It was massive in World War Two. Yeah, a lot. I don't know. It was a lot. I mean, yeah. Russia themselves lost something like twenty-seven million. Yeah, I don't know. Um, my phone's right here. I'm gonna <laughs> see if I can look it up. How many? How many people died in World War Two? Yeah, tens of millions, though, without without a doubt. Yeah. Um, so which would have been better to like make a deal with Hitler and have Hitler quote unquote win, yeah. but save these tens of millions of lives? Well, and I think a lot of people, when you, when you ask that question are like, well, what about the Jews? Like, but the real question should be, would the Holocaust have even happened if, if the war hadn't happened? And like I said, I don't know the the answer to that, but I'm pretty sure that... Oh, that's actually... I, I got it right in the first place. Uh, estimated between 50 and 85 million lives were 15, lost. 85. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, The they didn't start exterminating the Jews till the war started. Yeah. Well, until they started taking over all these territories where they were at. Well, there were plenty of Jews in Germany. Yeah, but... Um, but Th like but exile was an numbers. option. If, yeah, yeah, well, because that's how it started was mm -hmm. they were um, more or less, I mean, I don't know. I wasn't there, obviously. But my understanding is is that the that they were trying to get the Jews to just leave. Mm -hmm. like they, they were just like, uh, you're, you're not welcome in Germany anymore. It's time to go somewhere else. Yeah, and but other countries wouldn't take them either. Well, yeah, yeah. So that's always a problem. And of course, that's, you know, that's that remains my theory about why Israel was established 
It yeah. wasn't to give the Jews their homeland back. It was to give them some land away from us. From everybody else. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I mean, because it's the Europeans and the um, United States that that created that territory. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I, I really think it wasn't really about returning the Jews to their homeland. It was about making sure that they had a place to put the Jews that wasn't in Europe or the United States. Yeah. And now the Jews are doing the same thing to the Palestinians. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, no, they, they, I mean, I'm sure that the Israel, that they'd be perfectly happy just shipping them out, but nobody mm-hmm. will take them. Yeah. Same situation. Mm-hmm. So, and it's amazing that they don't see it. I mean, they have you to, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, I don't they know, have man. to. Like, <laughs> I, uh, it makes you wonder if it, it's like it's our turn now. In the same way that um, people that were abused as children are more likely to abuse their own children. To be abusers, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know. World's a crazy yeah, place. I was man. gonna say, yeah, history is a crazy thing. Yeah, some wild stuff. So is fascinating. I just started yeah. reading. No, I don't need to get onto that now. We're already in an hour. Let's go yeah. ahead and wrap it up. Yeah, I don't think I've got it. I just started else. reading Guns, Germs, and Steel, and I'll leave it at that. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. Well, uh, what's next week? Yeah, no, we, we should be good. No problems, I don't think. Okay. All right, so um, we expect to be back next week. That's the plan. <laughs> and uh, in the meantime, you can follow us on Facebook. Um, you can uh, comment or subscribe uh, iTunes, YouTube, Podbean, um, leave reviews, like and share. You can always email me at michael at the com if you have any commentary or questions or suggestions or new information or just to say hi. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> you accept I don't mind. all of those type of emails. Yeah, <laughs> I, I don't reject any emails. Yeah. Um, if you're a jerk, I might not respond, but <laughs> <laughs> and then again, jerk. I might, and you might wish that you hadn't been a jerk too. So uh, who knows? Yeah, right. <laughs> Test your luck. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so um, anyway, yeah, we expect to be back, back here next week when we finally get this right. And in the meantime, try to stay free. Life short, live free. Ciao. Later. Later.